All right, everybody, we are back this time for UFC Fight Night Cannoneer versus Bohio that takes place this upcoming Saturday, August 24th from the UFC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada with a main event bout in the middleweight division with the Fighting Nerds prospect in the number 12 ranked Kyle Bohio taking on the number 5 ranked Jared the Killer Gorilla Cannoneer. Bohio's coming off of that knockout victory over Paul Craig, while Jared Cannonier is coming off of that loss to Nasser Dean Imovov in a UFC Fight Night main event. Um, yeah, guys, I mean, this card isn't great. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, oh my god, I can't wait to break this card down. It's not that great, but we're going to break down seven fights on the card. It's not the full card. We've already been over it. We've talked about it before. There's just certain fights that really aren't worth spending time on when it comes to the breakdowns. If you want those fights broken down, I can give little quick breakdowns in the comment section of this video once I post it. Um, pretty good success on the Contender Series. Uh, eight and two out of the last two weeks. Uh, only one we missed last night was Billy Brand. And coincidentally, he was one of my favorite picks. But I did say that that was probably going to be the most competitive fight. And it didn't really get the chance to be competitive. Cody Haddon was able to catch him with a really good left hook off that little shoulder roll defense, and he snuck right in between that shoulder roll, clipped him on the chin, jumped on him with some ground and pound, took his back, and we knew that once the fight got to the ground, it was going to be Cody Haddon's world. It was just how easily would Haddon get Billy Brand down there, and um, you know he got him down there with his boxing, and we knew he had good striking. Better boxing on the side of Haddon, better kickboxing on the side of Billy Brand, but Brand loses, gets choked out in the first round, didn't start our night off great, but we got Kuniev correct with the TKO, we got Finney, we got Cortavius Romius, uh, even though we picked both of those guys to get finishes, but they did not, and we also picked Andreas Gustafsson, I believe we picked him second round TKO, so that was a pretty good pick, maybe we did first round, but um, yeah, I'm excited to see Gustafsson in the UFC, uh, Cortavius. I don't know. I'm not super sold on the guy yet. He should have been able to finish his opponent, but he wasn't. Um, but Imperatu was tough, man. He was losing the fight, but he was tough. He came there to win. So um, hopefully they give him another shot at a certain point in his career. But yeah, I mean, I liked Gustafson's performance. I thought it was really solid. And I'm kind of sour on the Billy Brand performance because I thought that kid was going to come in and look very good. But again, I guess Haddon was a favorite for a reason. So it makes sense. But yeah, let's jump into this fight card and break down UFC Fight Night, Cannoneer versus Bohio. All right, the first fight up is in the lightweight division between Vichaslav, Slava Claus, Borschev coming off that submission, but basically TKO loss to Chase Hooper, taking on James Yontrop, or Yontrop, Yamez Yontrop, I think I said that name right. Uh, he is coming off of his UFC debut loss to Chris Padilla, who was also a UFC debutant, and he lost that fight via submission as well. So, you know, some similarities between the two. Um, looking at the stats, you would favor a guy like Vyacheslav Borschev in this fight. Just off the rip, if you watched no tape, if you didn't watch anything, you would favor a guy like Borschev because he has that one thing. What is it? UFC experience. He's fought some really solid guys, um, fought Mike Davis, went to a decision, went back and forth with Nazim Sadyakov, who was very, very good, you know, in that fight. I thought Sadyakov would have won that by decision, but it was a draw because of the 10-8 in round two. Um, but the volume boxing, the fighting on the inside, the kicking game of Borschev is pretty solid as well. But it's mainly the boxing. This guy likes to get on the inside. He likes to slip and roll. He likes to work his way into that close range, into the pocket, and rip good punches. His punching technique is very, very solid. Ripping hooks to the body, coming up top, coming up the middle with uppercuts. Multiple shot combinations can switch stances as well. Attacks the inside low kick and outside low kick very well as again. Again, depending on what stance you're in, but he mainly fights out of that orthodox stance. Now you have James or Yamez Yantrop, and this guy, we don't really know in terms of the UFC experience. He won on the Contender Series by a decision, I believe, and then he came into the UFC and he lost to Chris Padilla. He got into a bad scramble, gave up his back. Padilla took advantage and was able to jump on his back and get the choke. Now Yantrop was winning on the feet. 
I don't want anybody to think that, oh, this guy, this guy got dominated. He was winning on the feet. He was landing good combinations. He was switching stances between orthodox and southpaw. Um, he has good front kicks to the body. His boxing is pretty solid with his one twos. And I really think that the way that Jan Throp has to approach this fight is by being a mixed martial artist. You don't want to get into a boxing match or a pure kickboxing match with a guy like Vyacheslav Borschev. Now, I thought for sure he was going to run through Chase Hooper and Chase Hooper dropped him. Now, is that more of a look on the positive side of the improvements of Chase Hooper or is that a look on the Borschev side and saying that this guy doesn't have that great of durability or did the Sadyakov fight take a lot of that durability away? I think it's more that the Sadyakov fight took a lot of his durability away. He was able to survive. He was able to find his way back into the fight. This guy's not going to quit and I do give him the stand-up advantage against a guy like Yanthrop but I also think that the grappling Mixed with the decent striking that I've seen Jan Trope use in his mixed martial arts career, the ground impound, um, the, the, the fighting from the top, and the fact that Borschev does not have great takedown defense, it's improved, but it's still not that great. I kind of favor Yamez Yantrop in this fight to use his grappling, and once he gets the fight down to the ground, use his elbows, use his hammer fists, you know, look to set up submissions, look for Borschev to give up a bad position and get submitted. Now, this is kind of a must-win position for Bicislav Borschev. He needs to win this fight because if you lose to this guy, after all the other losses you've had in your UFC career, it's not a good look, so... It, it's kind of do or die for Borschev, but I think Jan Trope's going to get the job done here, man. I think he's going to be able to compete on the feet, use his striking, use his stance changes, use his movement, and I think he's going to be able to out-grapple a guy like Vyacheslav Borschev. I just, this is more of me not having a lot of faith in Borschev than me thinking that Jan Trope is going to win this fight. Like, I, I, if Borschev has had better, or had had better performances... I probably would pick him, but he just loses fights that he's supposed to win. The fight IQ just really isn't there with some of the decisions that he makes. And I worry about his durability, and I know Yanthrop can throw good combinations, and he's pretty technical on his feet. Not as technical as Borschev, but I think he can get by, and he's going to be the much better grappler. So give me James or Yamez Yanthrop to defeat Vyacheslav Borschev via a second round ground and pound TKO. I think he's going to flatten him out and he's either going to get that rear naked choke and go for a sub or he's going to ground and pound. I'm going to go with the ground and pound because I know that that's what this guy likes to do. So give me Yamez Yanthrop to defeat Vyacheslav Borschev via second round TKO in the first fight that we break down. All right, the next fight up, you've got a battle between Zachary Reese and another guy from the Contender Series in Jose Medina. Um, you look at the stats and you're going to think that this fight is going to be very close. And I'm not super high on Zach Reese, but I am much higher on Zach Reese than I am on Medina. Um, the one thing I will say is that this guy does not quit on himself. He can get beat up, he can get ripped apart, and he can get dominated and find a way to come back. So I would give him the advantage when it gets to the second round, when it gets to the third round. But I do not think we're going to make it that far. Um, I, I know he lost on the contender series and you know he looked good in terms of finding a way back into the fight getting takedowns of his own having some success this guy's mainly going to look to grapple going to look to wrestle and uh, try to get in your face and rough you up and you know i don't think reese is the best mixed martial artist but i definitely think that he's better than jose medina look at the stats that i posted here on the screen significant strikes landed per minute 1.6 strikes absorbed per minute 4.87 now it's 5.32 strikes landed per minute for zachary reese to 6.21 absorbed so both of these guys take more punches than they give but it's a lot better looking on this side of Zachary Reese than it is on the side of Medina. Could Medina tire out a guy like Zachary Reese later in the fight? Yeah, he can tire him out if he gets, you know, past that early storm, gets into the second and gets into the third. But the thing about Reese is he can knock you out on the feet. But if you take him down, he can also go for arm bars. He can go for triangles. And he will look to throw up submissions and even strike while you're in his submissions. So I don't really see any area of this fight where a guy like Medina is going to win unless he clips the chin of Zachary Reese. Because Zachary Reese can be hit. He is there to be hit. And we don't know how great his chin is, but we know he got knocked out with a slam by Cody Brundage when he probably was going to win that fight. 
but he does get hit. He doesn't have the best defense, so maybe Medina is able to weather the storm and then land a big shot and knock out a guy like Zachary Reese. It could happen. I just don't think that it does. I think Zachary Reese is going to come into this fight early. I think he's going to hurt Medina. I think Medina is going to panic wrestle. He's either going to lock up a guillotine or he's going to push him off, and he's going to finish this fight in the first round. Give me Zachary Reese to defeat Jose Medina by first round TKO. Could definitely be a submission. I think, you know what, I'll go submission. I think he's going to hurt this guy bad, going to cause him to panic wrestle, and he's going to lock up a guillotine choke in the first round and submit Jose Medina. Um, this is pretty much a gimme fight for Zachary Reese, even though Medina is tough. I think a lot of people can see what this is. It's a gimme fight. They want to get Zachary Reese another win. And um, I'm not super high on Zachary Reese in terms of UFC level opposition and being, you know, a top contender or a guy in the top 15 even. But I think this is a fight that he definitely is going to win and win in impressive fashion. So give me Zachary Reese first round guillotine choke submission. Kind of a club and sub variation. But yeah, this is a gimme fight for Reese. All right, the next fight up is in the featherweight division. You have a battle between Dennis Bazooka taking on the short notice replacement for Danny Silva in Francis the Fire Marshal. Um, I think that this fight's going to be close. I think it's kind of a coin flip in terms of who's going to win this fight. It's pretty close. I mean, I, I believe Danny Silva was going to beat a guy like Dennis Bazooka, even though I did give Bazooka the striking advantage. Bazooka has decent boxing. He puts his combinations together well, but it's really the kicking game of Dennis Bazooka that is the best weapon in his overall game. He's very active with his kicks. Um, he sets up his kicks very well, gets on the good angles. You know, if he's in the opposite stance of his opponent, he'll get to that outside foot and fire that kick to open up the, the targets. Um, he'll chop the outside low kick if you're in the same stance, can throw switch kicks, and puts his kind of puts his boxing behind his kicks um, but he was able to knock out Connor Matthews both of those guys came off the contender series as did Francis the fire marshal um, but I think Marshall is probably the better overall fighter I know that Dennis Bazooka trains out of the uh What's it called? I can't think of the name off the top of my head. Trains with Sarah Longo, so he's going to have good jiu-jitsu. He's going to have good grappling. But I do think he kind of would get exposed by Francis Marshall if the fight does hit the mat. Now, Marshall got dominated by Isaac Dolgarian. I think Dennis Bazooka would fare the same fate. So I'm not really looking at that fight too much in terms of breaking this fight down. Francis Marshall has good boxing. We saw him knock out Marcelo Rojo um, with a good counter hook. Caught him with a short hook. I think Bazooka's striking looks prettier, like he's more technical, he throws better strikes, he puts combinations together together better, but I do think Francis Marshall has more power, and I think he has that one-hitter quitter ability where he can catch Bazooka coming in and crack him on the chin. I think Marshall can use his wrestling. You just do have to think that Bazooka is coming into this fight on a full camp. That does play a factor. Marshall hasn't had a full camp. He's coming in on short notice. Originally was going to fight a guy like Danny Silva, who I would say is probably a better fighter than Francis Marshall, but I think Marshall's a little bit more dangerous in terms of his overall power and striking on the feet for a guy like Dennis Bazooka. We saw Bazooka get knocked out by Jamal Emmers early in the first round, um, very early KO. And, you know, I kind of soured on Bazooka after that because I thought Bazooka could have won that fight. But you know, he didn't. He got clipped. Anybody can get clipped early. And um, yeah, like I said, I think breaking this fight down, the better wrestler, the better grappler is probably Francis Marshall, but he's going to have to look out for the submissions, going to have to look out for the, the strikes from the bottom, you know, looking to set up submissions by opening them up with the palm strikes and things like that. But I do think Bazooka is going to come into this fight with a lot more confidence after that performance he had against Connor Matthews. Almost cost himself a few times by giving up his back and allowing for Matthews used to try to take his back and look for a choke but he was able to get out of it and then able to knock out Connor Matthews he was out striking him he was beating him up on the feet I do believe Bazooka is the better cleaner more technical striker but I think Marshall has more power and that could be the difference maker paired with his wrestling and his grappling um, I think this fight's gonna be close but I'm gonna go with Francis Marshall to find a knockout I think it might be ground and pound he might clip him coming in, but I think Marshall can land his combinations. I think he can use his wrestling, and I think he's going to be more 
well-rounded in this fight than a guy like Dennis Bazooka. I'm not 100% on this fight. I'm really not. But my pick is going to be Francis Fire Marshall. Uh, if you look at the stats, it's pretty even. Two-inch reach advantage for Marshall with the same height. I think he can use that reach advantage against Bazooka. But Bazooka is going to be fighting primarily at kicking range. So it might be a little bit harder for him to use it because he has to get past, get past the kicks. But um, strikes landed per minute, 4.16 strikes absorbed per minute 5.09 for bazooka 3.66 strikes landed per minute for marshall takes 4.07 so it's pretty pretty similar neck and neck kind of a 50 50 fight but i do like francis marshall's overall game a little bit more than dennis bazooka and i think he's going to have more ways to win and i think he's going to find the chin of dennis bazooka in an exchange with a short shot drop him jump on him and get him out of there maybe he gets a sub maybe he rocks him and submits him but i think he finds the chin cracks him and gets him out of there in the third round i'm gonna go francis fire marshall to get the win via third round tko could be a decision but i think he finds a finish so give me francis marshall third round tko over dennis bazooka all right, next up, we've got a battle in the middleweight division between Gerald Mearshart taking on Edmund Shabazian. Uh, looking at this fight, I think it's pretty clear that Gerald Mearshart's going to be the better grappler, while Edmund Shabazian is going to be the better striker. And it's really going to be a, a fact of who can get the fight where they need it to be in order to win. And I definitely think GM3 can take down Edmund Shabazian. I think it's more than capable, or I, I'm sorry, I believe he's more than capable of getting him down to the ground. But the thing is, Gerald Mearshart doesn't have great takedowns. He kind of wins these scrambles that they get into somehow, and then he ends up, you know, getting to the positions that he needs to. But he doesn't really have the wrestling to get it there. And I think that's the biggest disadvantage in this fight, and that's why I'm going to be picking Edmund Shabazian to win. I think Edmund Shabazian is going to be able to stop the takedowns of GM3, even though I don't think GM3 is really going to look for takedowns offensively. He's going to be looking to, you know, stay on the outside, pick him apart, and hit him with good counters as he comes in. Now, if Edmund gets tired, which we've seen him get tired before, then it does go into the hands of Gerald Mearshart. If it gets into the second, midpoint of the second round and beyond, I think it goes into the favor of GM3 because we know that he can survive the striking. We know that he can survive the power of Edmund Shabazian, and he's probably able to get a lot closer to him at that point in the fight and work his way to take his back, find ways to get trips, you know, knock him off balance, win scrambles, and end up on top. If GM3 is on the top of Edmund Shabazian, he's probably going to win with the submission. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, but I think it's going to be very hard for GM3 to get the fight to where he wants it to be. And I think in that time, Edmund Shabazian, who is the much cleaner, much more technical, and much more powerful striker, is going to be able to kind of light up Gerald Mearshart on the feet. I think he's going to pick him apart. I think he's going to land good counters. I think he'll stuff a couple takedowns early in the fight. And then I think he eventually lands a big shot that puts down GM3. GM3. So I'm going to go Edmund Shabazian, uh, second round TKO, late first round, somewhere in between there. And uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty self-explanatory one to talk about. All right, the next fight up is in the welterweight division between Michael Morales and Neil Magny. Uh, I don't think we have to spend a whole lot of time on this fight. We know what we're going to get with Neil Magny. He's usually going to be at a huge height and reach advantage. The only thing is, in this fight, he only has a one-inch reach advantage. He's probably going to be able to use his reach a little bit better than Morales by keeping on the outside, using that long jab, putting combinations behind the jab. And a lot of the times in Magny's recent fights, he's been using more of a grappling-heavy approach. Even if he's not taking you down, he's trying to use the jab to enter into range, and then he's trying to go with the over-under hooks, uh, go to the double underhooks, push you up against the cage, maybe change levels and go for takedowns. He can't go for submissions like he got against Daniel Rodriguez. But honestly, I think this is Morales' fight to win. He's younger, he's fresher, he's going to have less miles on the tank. And, you know, Magny did put back a prospect, you know, halt the momentum of a big prospect in Mike Malott by tiring him out and then eventually finishing him in the third round with a TKO after he was pretty clearly losing the first two rounds. But I think Morales is a different fighter. You know, but we thought that about Mike Malott before the fight. A lot of people thought it was an easy win for Mike Malott. And, you know, he was able to get him tired. I think Magny is going to have the cardio advantage in the third round if it gets that far. I think that if he can survive the awkward, lengthy striking and the power of Morales, 
then yeah, Magni can win. I don't think Morales is a future world champion. And, you know, I don't really see that from him yet. Maybe he can be that. He has the skills, but he fights with his hands down. Uh, kind of uses a pull counter style where he'll pull right hand, left hook, throw big straight punches. Uh, throws punches from awkward angles, which makes him hard to see. Um, I think he's going to be able to finish Neil Magny here. You know, I thought that Ian Gary was going to finish Neil Magny. And he, he could have 100% finished him with how many times he dropped him with the leg kicks. But I think Morales is going to... You know, stuff the takedowns, stay away from the cage, use good counter striking, catch Magni coming in with straight punches, hit some good low kicks to kind of slow down the movement of Magni, keeping him stationary in one specific area or one specific spot. And then I think he's just going to tee off with a big combination and put him down. I'm going to go with Michael Morales to defeat Neil Magni. I'll go uh, third round TKO. Potentially it could go to decision though. But, you know, I think that this is a fight that's kind of a passing of the torch in a way. And, you know, they tried it with Mike Malott. It didn't work out. They're going to try it again here with Michael Morales. And I think it is going to work. I think Michael Morales is going to be too powerful. Um, you know, he's a lot younger. Like I said, less miles on the tank. But he's going to have that UFC experience disadvantage. And if Magny starts to sense that Morales is slowing down, he'll put that pace on him, put the pressure on him. He can go for submissions, even standing, because he's got really long arms and legs. He can try to lock up that Darce choke like he did on Rodriguez. And uh, there is a potential possibility that he slows down Morales enough to win in the later rounds. But I think Morales is going to find his counters, find his shots, you know, have a probably a close first round, but then start to beat him up in the second and not allow Magni to get that second win. And I think he is going to finish him in the third round. So give me Michael Morales to win via a third round TKO. But like I said, potentially could go to decision. Um, but I think this is a fight where Morales can probably find a finish. So I'm going to go with the younger Michael Morales to get the job done here. All right, now we are at the co-main event of the evening in the strawweight division between Angela Overkill Hill taking on Tabitha Baby Shark Ricci. Uh, you look at the stats, two inch height advantage for Hill and a three and a half inch reach advantage. She lands more strikes per minute and actually takes less. I think before the Tisha Pennington fight, I probably would have picked Ricci here. You know, I thought... Uh, Ricci could probably use her grappling to get Hill down to the mat. And she is probably going to be the stronger grappler. And that would be her best path to victory or path of least resistance, I guess you could say. But Angela Hill, I think, has kind of hit a new level in her career. She beat the piss out of Luana Pinheiro and then finally got that UFC finish via submission. That is something that I ended up predicting on the podcast as well was for Hill to win by submission. And in this fight... I think Hill is the much cleaner striker, much sharper. Um, I think the more powerful striker might be Ricci. You know, she throws some pretty big punches. Uh, she was able to hurt Lupi Godinez a couple times in, in their fight. At the end of the round, she was able to crack her with some big shots. And we saw Angela Hill get dropped multiple times by Mackenzie Dern. And, you know, we know that Dern does not have great striking, but her striking did not look bad in her last fight. So maybe she's improving, and maybe we're just a little bit too hard on Mackenzie Dern, who's known as a grappler at heart. Um, but I think Angela Hill should be able to win this, as long as she doesn't allow Ricci to get takedowns over and over and concede a lot of control time. Uh, I do think that this fight's probably going to be close, but I think when we get into the second, midpoint of the second, into the third round, I think the pace and pressure of Angela Hill is going to get to Tabitha Ricci because Ricci doesn't like to get hit, but she also doesn't have great defense. I mean, look, she lands 4.28 strikes a minute, takes 4.94. So pretty much every one strike you're hitting her with, you're getting hit, or every one strike she's hitting you with, you're hitting her with almost two strikes more than that. You know, just based on the statistics, you know, you're hitting her, She's hitting you, boom, you're hitting her right back, and she's not getting out of the way. Hill is going to be a lot longer, a lot taller, and if Ricci wants to win this fight, she has to make it dirty. She has to push, you know, cage push, get into the clinch, take down Angela Hill, work from the top position, and really just try to rough her up. And I think there is going to be scenarios where Ricci gets some takedowns, but I think Angela Hill is going to work back up to the feet. And I honestly believe that if Angela Hill was able to beat a girl like Denise Gomes, then I don't think she'll have much of a problem beating a girl like Tabitha Ricci. Like I said, who I picked against Tisha Pennington and, 
you know, she won, but did she really win? It was one of those fights where not a lot of people actually believed that she won that fight. So I think Hill's going to be at a much bigger advantage on the feet. She's going to use her range. She's going to use her reach against the girl in Tabitha Ricci who gets hit a lot. And yes, she could get in close. Yes, she could get the takedowns. Yes, she could control from the top. But I think it's going to be harder for Ricci to get Hill down than people are thinking. I think if Ricci wins, it probably is a submission win. Or she gets on top and just wins based off a lot of control time with Hill not being able to get up to the feet. But I think Hill's going to use her reach, use her range, use that long crispy jab use her one two stay on the outside uh threaten with submissions but i think she'll use that more to stop the takedowns or stop potential passes once the fight does hit the mat and i think angela hill's gonna win this fight um i would say a finish i do think she's live for maybe a second or third round tko but at the same time i kind of expect this fight to go to decision because i do think there will be some takedown success from tabitha ricci so i'm gonna go angela hill 29 28 split decision I think it probably does go to the scorecards. I think it is going to be a close fight, you know, for the majority of it because I do think Tabitha Ricci's wrestling and takedowns and top control are going to win her at least one round on the scorecards. But I think overall, the, the striking, the range management, the distance control is going to be really what pays dividends for Angela Hill here. And I think she has much more volume on the feet. She keeps a distance and range much better. And I believe she's better defensively. So give me Angela Hill to win this fight. I'm going to go 29-28 split decision for Angela Hill. Maybe Angela Hill in round three. I think it's I think it's possible. Um, but I'm going to go Angela Hill to win this fight by decision. All right, and now we're at the main event of the evening in the UFC's middle weight division with a fighter coming out of one of the hottest camps in the world right now in the Fighting Nerds, taking on a top contender in the middle weight division. We have a battle between the Fighting Nerds, Kyle Bohio, taking on Jared the Killer Gorilla Cannoneer. Um, the, the funny thing about this fight is that both of these guys fight out of that southpaw position, but I kind of feel like we're going to see Jared Cannonier fight primarily out of orthodox. Uh, we saw him do that in the fight against Marvin Vittori, and it worked decently well for him, um, but he is coming off that TKO loss to Nasruddin Imavov in the fourth round. I believe it was the fourth round in that fight where the ref stopped it via standing TKO. A lot of people didn't agree with the stoppage, but... At the end of the day, the fight was definitely in the hands of Nasruddin Imovov when we got into those later rounds, which is something that we thought was not going to be the case. We thought it was more going to be on the side of the veteran and Cannoneer. Um, Cannoneer's the much more powerful striker. I know Bohio's coming off that KO over Paul Craig, but that was a fight where I picked Bohio to win by TKO because we knew that Craig had a great jujitsu game and we knew that Bohio coming out of the fighting nerds probably wasn't going to want to test the grappling. So it was going to be more of a striking battle. And Bohio's a decent striker. He, he's not a better striker than Cannoneer. You know, Cannoneer uses his angles, uses his footwork. He uses lateral movement a lot better than Baha than uh, Kayo does. But Kayo's pretty light on the feet, in and out. And he finds the pathway for that right hook to the straight left hand. The one, two down the middle. Uh, throws that rear kick pretty well against the opposite stance fighter. And, you know, he, he does what he needs to do. So he definitely is not incompetent. He's not going to be completely outmatched on the feet, except in terms of power. But I think this really just comes down to MMA being a young man's game for the most part. You know, we talk about experience a lot, and I do think that the experience, the championship experience or championship fight experience does play into the factor or play into the hand in the favor of Cannoneer. But at the same time, I think Kyle Bohio is kind of just going to, like I said, prove that this is a young man's game and he's going to be able to find a way to beat Jared Cannoneer. And I think he finds a way to finish him. You know, I went back and watched the Derek Brunson fight and I know Cannoneer has really good takedown defense. You know, he caught Jack Hermanson with that good uppercut, you know, and that led to the TKO finish. But he got taken down pretty easily by Derek Brunson and then got controlled, got mounted and almost got put in a rear naked choke. And I do believe that Derek Brunson has much better wrestling, but I think Bohio has levels, levels above uh, Derek Brunson in terms of the jiu-jitsu. Or should I say he is levels above him in terms of the jiu-jitsu. And he's not afraid to strike, and his striking is getting better. I think we're going to see Cannoneer primarily, like I said, fight out of that orthodox stance. Ohio is going to stay in southpaw. I think that straight left is going to be there just like it was for Marvin Vittori. And uh, I think the biggest difference between Vittori and Bohio is that Vittori is a better wrestler, but I think Bohio is a better jiu-jitsu artist. And I think that that makes it 
more dangerous for Cannoneer because he can find submissions on the feet. A lot of the times if they're wrestlers and they get submissions, it's after they get the takedowns. Bohio can probably find a way to take the back of Cannoneer, maybe push him up against the cage. I, I like Jared Cannoneer. You know, I picked him to beat Nasr Dinamavov, and, you know, he didn't come through in that spot. But I think the power is on the side of Cannoneer. I think he's very good with his footwork, very good with his movement. He's got a good straight right hand, a good straight left. He finds his angles well, very good uppercut. But I do think that this is Kyle Bohio's time. And I think a lot of people are going to play the veteran here. And this is a fight where I just don't think I can play the veteran in Cannoneer. Could he knock him out? 100%. Could he outstrike him in a pure striking fight? Yes. But I think the overall mixing up of the game between the jujitsu, the wrestling, the striking, you know, the, the, the newfound confidence in his striking game i think he's going to be able to beat cannoneer by specifically by just being the better more well-rounded fighter i think he's way more well-rounded and he has those extra things to pull out of his pocket if the striking isn't going in the direction that it needs to go so i'm gonna go kyle bohio to find a finish here i think it could be a tko but i'm gonna go with a rear naked choke submission i think he's gonna hurt cannoneer Cannoneer's going to panic wrestle or shoot, and then he's going to give up his back and, and take his neck. So I think Bohio's going to win this fight by submission, but if he did win by TKO, it wouldn't surprise me because we've seen Cannoneer get rocked and wobbled in multiple fights, and he did just get finished in his last fight by Nasruddin Imovov. Um, I think Imovov's a much better striker, but I think Bohio... His striking is a little bit underrated, and I think that's going to play pay dividends for him to have success in this fight, even on the feet. So I'm going to go with Kyle Bohio to get a submission in round three. I'm going to go with a round three rear naked choke submission, but potentially it could be a TKO because I think he can find the pathway for that straight left hand down the pipe. I think he can find the, the angles to throw that check hook as Cannoneer comes in, but he's going to have to mind his P's and Q's. So I think the minute that he hurts him, if he can get to his back and grab his neck i think that's what's going to happen kind of like ddp from uh, the last weekend so give me kyle bohio to defeat jared the killer gorilla cannoneer and crack into the top five winning this fight by a third round rear naked choke submission all right that's going to be it for my preview predictions and breakdown for ufc fight night bohio versus cannoneer or cannoneer versus bohio you can get these predictions on the youtube channel that you're listening to this at right now at the touch em up podcast I'm your host, Double M, and I'm out. Have a good night, everybody, all right?